Well, let's get into the word. Praise you, Jesus. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I believe it's so valuable to know what time we're in. We've been showing a lot of videos about what's going on in the world, the prophecies that have been decreed, uh, those that have been received from God, from the Spirit of God that are believed to be, as far as what we can expect to happen. But we know that prayer is what's going to change things. That we're to decree the prophecies. We're to speak those forth. We're to, we're to demand change in the earth. And uh, that's what's really going to bring about the change. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go to verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, right? I mean, we don't fight with our fists. We fight with our words. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, they're not earthly. They're not natural. They're of another realm, another kingdom. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, the weapons God gave us to use are not natural in, in, in their content. Our weapons are supernatural, meaning above the natural. And I want you to catch it just starting out this morning. There's the natural and there's the above the natural. Now, what do you think would have more power? Natural or above the natural. We are called to be supernatural people. And that's where I want to go this morning. Is In fact, I've, I've titled this morning's message, What Will You Allow? What will you allow in your life? What will you allow in the nation? What will you allow in the world? Because God gave us the authority. Amen? So it says we've been given weaponry that is above the natural. You know, I hear so many people say, well, I guess I've tried everything. I guess all I have left to do now is just to pray. Well, you just brought prayer to subnatural. You said, I've tried everything natural, and I guess I'm left now with the last choice, which is subnatural. And genuine faith-oriented prayer is never subnatural. It's always supernatural. I believe it's where we should go first. Amen. Our life should be, should be totally dominated by decreeing words of faith in front of us instead of trying to fix everything behind us with faith. I mean, how many know that God in the Word prophesied everything that was to come to pass? Amen. Amen. You know the one event I find in Scripture that God did not prophesy? That Adam would eat that fruit. God didn't prophesy that. He says, he says if you eat of it, do you follow me? You shall die. So he prophesied the results of eating, but he didn't say you're going to eat it. Amen. He had a choice there. But from that point on, once Adam ate of the fruit, what's, the, what's really the, one of the first things he said to Adam? He said, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. What did he just prophesy at that fall? I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. He prophesied from the fall, I'm sending a Redeemer. And from that point on, the scripture is full of prophetic declarations of the coming Savior, Jesus, and full of declarations of what the body of Christ, the church, was going to do once he came on the scene. All the way through the end times. See, God didn't prophesy Adam's fall any more than he prophesied your fall. I mean, you're not going to fall. God hasn't prophesied anything negative in your life. The enemy is the one that brought the temptation to Adam, right? And to Eve. The enemy is the one that instigated the fall of man. And now he's still the one 
that's trying to get us to buy into natural existence, natural limitation, natural results. But we have weaponry that's been given to us through Jesus, prophesied in the word, that we would be given power over all that the enemy could do. Do you see that? So the question again is, what will we allow the enemy to do? Amen. We'll look at this further in just a second. It says, our, our weaponry is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I truly believe there are, there are spiritual strongholds placed over cities and nations. Amen. Lance Wall now was talking about revival is hitting North Korea. Now, think about this. He, I think he mentioned this in the video we watched Thursday night. That Seoul, South Korea, yes, the home of Dr. Paul young Cho, who at one time had the world's largest church, over a million members. He's still got the million members, but there are other churches, I believe, now that have gotten bigger. And he established a faith-filled church, and he said at Prayer Mountain, where I understand at Prayer Mountain there are over 10,000 people praying 24-7. Thirty to forty miles from the border of North Korea, and their number one prayer is, "Bring down the darkness of North Korea and reunite us as a nation." Now, with that kind of prayer going on for forty years, forty years of Doctor Cho, for another forty-one, for that kind of prayer going on. What chance do you think the darkness has to maintain its grip on North Korea? I believe God's about to bring a revival. And God strategically placed that church next to the area of stronghold to bring it down. Amen. And I'm expecting, I'm not prophesying, God hasn't told me, but I'm expecting to see major shifts in North Korea that the gospel's going to have much more liberty to propagate. Why? Because the, but because the strongholds that dominate that area have been brought down by prayer. They're falling. And I believe God's established his church in Georgetown, Kentucky. Because there's much darkness. There is much witchcraft in this area. Amen? Demonic operation. Uh... Think, I mean, we, we love, how many love Kentucky? I love Kentucky. Now think of the Kentucky economy. What are the top three things in the, the Kentucky economy? Alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. <laughs> Alcohol, tobacco, horse racing. And have been for generations. Amen. I think the top movers in this economy should be Strunk speakers. You follow me? And whatever business God tells you to raise up. That, that God, he wants to take this area. And we're the ones that determine what's allowed. Because we've been given the authority, right? So he said, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Now, let, let me back up again. We recognize there are strongholds over lands, over states, over cities, over nations, right? But the number one area of stronghold that exists are the mindsets in people's souls. The thought processes that limit what they can believe God for. Amen. You want to know what one of the most powerful strongholds of this area is? Now, don't let me lose anybody with this. But we celebrate the Bible Belt in the South. I mean, the Bible Belt was birthed out of the Second Great Awakening in America. It was birthed out of what took place in Cane Ridge and other churches around here. Produced a major revival that swept through the South. But now, a spirit of religion 
has taken over much of the Christian populace in this region. And instead of having expectations for the supernatural, except to go to heaven when we die, we are still limited by natural thinking, and what should be a supernatural church is a neutered church. Is a powerless church, a church dominated by tradition, who embrace tradition, who say, oh, we love our church traditions. I don't even want the word tradition in our church operations. Because Jesus said your tradition makes void the word of God. It makes it powerless. So not only is there alcohol and gambling and tobacco dominant in this area, there's also a spirit of religion where the church who's, who should be, should be operating in so much power, they're opposing the spiritual forces that are uh, fighting the power of God being released. Instead, we've got the church itself fighting the power of God that should be released. We don't think that speaking in tongues is of, of God, it's of the devil. Oh, you pushed them over when you laid hands on them. Or do you follow me? That they're fighting the supernatural versus embracing it. Now, you're not trying to attack anybody with this. I'm just telling you, there is a genuine, how many believe there, there is a spirit of gambling? There is a gambling addiction that exists. A ask Art Schleister, the prominent quarterback out of Ohio State who got addicted to gambling and lost everything out of it. How many people you know that got so caught up in gambling, they just, it wiped them out? How about alcohol? There's probably hardly a person in here that, that can't point to somebody they know, probably related to, that alcohol destroyed their lives. Somebody once told my mother, she went to a class reunion and, and they were talking about our family and the lady says, I've, I've never met a shoot who wasn't a drunk. Alcohol destroyed my family, uh, at least highly debilitated it and, and destroyed many. And uh, I've got some relatives uh, I don't know how many were killed in, in alcohol-related accidents. So there's a spirit behind alcohol. Amen? Why do you think they call it spirits? There's truth in that. And, of course, nicotine is an addiction, and I'm sure there's probably a spirit that's connected to that as well. Uh, but listen, there is a genuine spirit a religion that I believe is more powerful, carries more authority, and is more dominant in the earth than any of those other spirits. I believe it's easier to get an alcoholic delivered than a religious person redeemed or renewed in the mind. And, you know, we have the bookstore here. I've ran into so many people that come in want to preach to us you know, some vain tradition of men. So the strongholds are areas of thinking that don't align with the word of God that people are connected to in such a powerful fashion, they won't let it go. Well, that's what my preacher always told me. That's what my pastor said, and I believe it. That's what grandma says, so that's what I believe. Well, what does the word say? Well, they read the Bible all the time. Have you read it? Don't need to. Grandma read it. Here's an example. I really didn't mean to get stuck in this area, but, but, but here we are. Here's an example of what I'm talking about, a religious stronghold. Many of you, I'm sure, may have grown up in or went to denominational churches where they told you, Speaking in tongues is of the devil. Yet you read the word, it's, it's in the word repeatedly. And Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Amen. Got a whole chapter on prophesying and speaking in tongues in, in, in 1 Corinthians. And what happens when you get to those areas of, of Scripture, when you, when you entertain this mentality, 
you read it, and as you're reading, you skim those, those spots. Well, I don't understand that. that. That can't be for today. You know, and you have these explanations. Well, Paul, man, he spoke multiple languages. Or that was in his day, but now that the first century apostles are all dead, we don't. And we've explained away praying in tongues. We have explained away divine healing and divine health. Well, we have doctors now. We don't need God to move on us with healing. So doctors replaced God? But we believe these things because we've been raised in them, and traditional thinking produces a stronghold that we, we have trouble getting through. I am convinced one of my assignments from God, because I wasn't raised in church, one of my assignments from God is to be a killer of religious cows. Just let it go. Just. Sorry about that image. Amen. Just let that thing bleed out right there. That's all. We are, we are to have our mind renewed to the deep truths of the word and not limit God by strongholds and be willing to open up our thinking to consider new concepts the word may be bringing to us. Because here's the absolute truth. Our forefathers did not understand 100% of the word of God. Your grandma did not understand 100% of the word of God. And no one today yet understands 100% of the Word of God. And where things aren't understood, we tend to put in religious explanations that then become tradition, that become guarded, and we don't challenge. And God's calling His end-time church to challenge some old teachings. Amen. So sometimes in here, you know, you come in and the teacher starts relating to you theories of the word. How many know I use the word theory uh, not, in, not infrequently? These are theories. This is our attempt to get past prior hindrances to the power of God moving or to man's explanations of what they thought the word meant. And we'll theorize possibilities like, you know, what about the dinosaurs? What about Job? What about... Amen. What about the rapture? And so, uh, because man has not known everything about the word, and God's building the church on released revelation, we've got to be willing to receive new revelation that many times has to offset mistruth. Do you see that? So when it's talking about strongholds, primarily it's those areas of thinking that you think the word of God says that it really doesn't. Or where you've replaced supernatural mentalities with natural expectations. Those are strongholds. And the Word of God has the ability to renew our mind to live beyond that limitation. Amen. Then it says casting down imaginations. The word imagination is based on the word logos. And it's, it's talking about, again, your thoughts. What thoughts you have that do not agree with God's word. And guess what? We all have them. You have already entertained today thoughts that did not agree with the word of God. I'll guarantee it, each of us. But some type of thought we didn't cast down that didn't agree with the word. That little boo-boo you have. Well, it'll be healed in three or four days, I guess. It will be, that's, but it's natural thinking. Are you following me? We have a right for instantaneous healing. I'm trying to attack any. I'm just saying, if you're thinking something negative, or you're thinking a natural event that, that, that you're not expecting God to intervene on, you're in some fashion entertaining an imagination a thought that is not fully aligned with the word. 
Or, you know, I guess my such and such relative will never be saved. Amen. Or God can never move there. Nothing goes right for me. Whatever thoughts. Those become imaginations that we're to cast down. And every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's the word. We're to take authority over these, right? And I love verse 6. And having it a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Having it a readiness to revenge all disobedience once you get the revelation of where you missed it. What this talking about is, is once you realize you've been tolerating a stronghold, once you realize the enemies have been playing you, you're ready to get even. Which brings us back to today's title is, what will you allow? See, you've got to be somebody that determines when I see it in the Word, I'm done playing with it. It's revenge time. I refuse to allow what the enemy has suckered me into in the past once I see the truth. See, once you recognize that God's made available for you divine healing, how much pain and sickness will you allow? Let me explain this for a minute so I'm not offending anybody. I recognize if you break a toe, you sprain an ankle, you bump your head, it's going to hurt. Do you follow me? I mean, I'm, not, I, I'm in the natural, it's going to hurt. And I'm not saying if you're in pain, you're missing God. What I'm saying is what issue in your bo physical body are you tolerating and not using the word out against to recover from? Well, you know, I just have this arthritis in my hand and it's, I just take some aspirin, it's fine. Why tolerate? Why allow what the word of God says you got supernatural power over? Amen. Well, me and my neighbor just don't get along. I guess it'll be like that. Well, is that really what God would have you do? You get what I'm talking about? What will you allow? Well, you know, we just have wicked politicians. I guess the nation's in for a collapse. What will we allow? Because I believe we have the ability to pray light arise in dark places. Amen? I, uh, and I believe God's turning on the lights right now. And when the lights come on, the cockroaches flee. I had a conversation with a relative yesterday who said they were depressed. And I said, well, you need to just count your blessings. And, of course, they were trying to think of something to be blessed for. I said, I saw an article. Maybe some of you saw it. They're now making bread in Brazil with cockroaches. They're raising up cockroaches, massive amounts, drying them, grinding them, putting them in bread for extra protein because they said it's more efficient and, and, and nutritious than beef and has less impact on global warming. So they're eating bread with cockroaches. I said, thank God you don't have to eat bread with cockroaches in it. It's amazing what they're using global warming to, to sucker us into, right? We have a cockroach problem in the city. Well, let's just make bread out and tell the people it's, 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 for the, it's to save the earth. <laughs> Amen. We're to be those that become... How can I say this? Vengeance minded against the powers of darkness. Once you get a revelation with the devil stolen from you, you determine to turn things around. Go to Genesis chapter 1. And let's, let's step into this further. I didn't set the timer. How long, Charles? 25 minutes? 
Well, I was supposed to be at least halfway done, and I have 30 verses. But 25, so. Genesis chapter 1, we know this is a chapter where God created the earth, right? And verse 26, this is, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The first thing God gave man when he created him was his own image. I heard Bill Winston say this last week. Uh, I was watching one of his programs. And he said, when God made man, he took a selfie. Amen. And we're the results of God taking a selfie. Now, how many believe that God is all-powerful? How many believe that God doesn't tolerate uh, sin in heaven? You remember we read the parable here a week or so ago about the man that came to the wedding feast that didn't have the right garment on? And the Lord said to him, oh, that's okay. We don't care what you wear in this place. Come on, have the best seat. God did not tolerate. Because this is a type of the kingdom. God says he doesn't tolerate sin in his kingdom. We shouldn't tolerate in our life either, right? And so we're made in God's image who is intolerant to that which would rise up and destroy his creation. And how much, since we're made in his image, how much should we also be intolerant of anything that would tamper with God's will for our lives, for our families? What will we allow? We've been given the authority. Now he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Say dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I believe when it says creepy thing, it's talking about the devils as well. Man's given authority over the demonic. So when we read this list, he says over everything on the earth. There's only one thing excluded from this list. What, do you, what is that one thing excluded we don't have authority over? Other people. Right? We have a... See, God gave man a free will. The power of choice. And when you start trying to tamper with somebody's free will... You are operating outside of the image God made you in. Through manipulation. Through intimidation, domination. We call those forms of witchcraft, right? Through trying to manipulate people's emotions or the, you know, their actions through what we do to get what we want. That's outside of God's image. You are told to dominate everything but other people. Amen. And so he said, I've given you dominion, which is power to control, power to rule. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. I believe that's saying he's blessing covenant. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. There's our replenish again, right? You can't replenish if it wasn't already plenished at one time. Going back to our dual creation discussion. And subdue it and have dominion, have dominion, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. It didn't include other people because there were no other people yet at this time, right? And then God gave them seed, the power to replicate what was in the garden. And so God gave man dominion. Now, we always have to throw this in because there are many people watching by video. 
A lot are declaring or saying, if God is real, why are things so bad in the earth? We hear this all the time. If God is so good, if he's so loving, why did he let that young child die? Why did he let that woman be tortured and whatever else? Why, why did all this happen? Why did the puppy have his ears cut off? See, the other stuff didn't bother me. When I said puppy and ears, some of you are like, oh, Jesus. To me, that is a horrendous thing to do. Why did God allow that to happen? He didn't. We allowed it to happen. Mankind allowed it to happen. God gave dominion to the, to, 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 of the earth to man. And now nothing happens on earth unless a man allows it. Amen. And mankind in his cursed state has made a mess of the earth. But God's calling forth his church to reverse the curse. Again, Romans chapter 8 says, All creation groans and travails for the manifestation of the sons of God. God's going to release his glory through his end time bride to bring restoration to much of the earth. Amen. What will we allow? I believe when the glory hits, we're going to stop a whole bunch of stuff going on. Are you following me? It's going to shut down. It's going to shut down gambling. It's going to shut down alcohol. It's going to shut down uh, tobacco to, to a high level. It's going to shut down prostitution. Because it has in the past when the revivals have hit. It's going to shut down school shootings. It's going to shut down this whole... Uh, it's going to shut down abortion. The glory is going to do all of that. But we should be practicing shutting things down now. We should be using the dominion we have now. Not wait for some revival to hit or the glory to hit. Let's use our authority now by faith and shut some things down. Both in our personal lives, in our families, in our workplace, city, nation, and world. Thank you, Lord God. Uh, I like, you may or may not be aware of this, but the summit is Tuesday, right? June 12th, it's, that's Tuesday. Is the 30-year anniversary, 30 years to the day, of President Ronald Reagan telling Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. God's a God of dates. He's a God of anniversaries. We're living in a monumental time. And I believe this summit is the result of not just Dr. Cho's church praying, but the world Christian populace praying for an outpouring of God, for shifts to take place. Amen? Thank you, Lord, he's raised up a King Cyrus to rule our nation. Amen. To govern, I shouldn't say rule, govern our nation. So God gave dominion to the earth to man. We're the ones that have made a mess out of it. The curse has made a mess out of it. But now God's assigned his church to reverse the curse. The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. God intends to invert money from the hands of the wicked to the hands of the church. Oh my, I may go down a vein here some people won't like. We've always declared in Christianity the golden rule. As do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I remember that as a kid. I wasn't even a Christian when we heard that. The golden rule. It was, it was written in the school walls, you know, when I was young. Do unto others. But there's really a natural golden rule as well. And that is he that has the gold makes the rules. You heard that, right? He that has the gold makes the rules. Money rules the earth. In the natural realm, in the, in the world of mammon, 
He that has the mammon rules. Why do you think George Soros has been so influential? Because he has the money to back wicked politicians. He has the finances to, to bus in protesters to cause a certain image for the news media. And he uses his money for evil purposes. And I thank the Lord. He's maybe the most frustrated person on the earth right now. Except for Hillary Clinton. Just my opinion. So somebody. Asked. I've, it's actually happened more than one. Does your pastor ever talk about politics? <laughs> Only when he has to. Money governs the world ruled by mammon. Do you follow me? And if God is going to shut down wickedness and a world is governed by mammon, I believe one area he's going to use to do it is he's going to strip away their money. But he's going to do it through supernatural means. There will be natural events that will cause it. You follow me? There will be natural things that cause money to move. But it's going to be instigated or activated through a supernatural move of God. Through one prayer and two Christians activating God's promises in the word. The word of God says God is not mocked. What sort of a man soweth that shall he also reap. Right? It says that God's going to give back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over when you're a giver. That as you sow, you have a right to believe for 30, 60, 100 full return. In fact, there are more promises about finances in the scripture than healing and salvation put together. You cannot read the scriptures and not see God talking about money. Because you recognize how the world of mammon runs. And you recognize that if he's going to dominate the world of mammon, he's got to get the money to his people. Do you follow me? And I believe that God intends for his end time church to become radical givers. Not just tithing. I heard this years ago and it almost offended me. I, I was first saved. And uh, I mean, I just learned to tithe and tithe was stretching all the faith I had. And he got up and it was, it was a uh, visiting minister at the church I was at. And he started talking about the baby tithe. Baby tithe? It took everything I had to tithe. Not that I was broke, but just all the faith I had. And this baby amount? Why? Because tithe, you have no seed in the ground yet. The tithe already belongs to God. How can you sow what belongs to somebody else? God says the first tenth is holy unto him. He says if you keep it, you're robbing him. You know, uh, we pay a rent payment on this church building every month to the one that owns the, the deed, right? And when I go to them and I pay the rent, I don't go to them. I'm sowing this into you. I can't even say, I, I believe for a hundred for return on this seed I'm, I'm depositing in your account. It's owed him. I can't sow what doesn't belong to me. It's already his. It's owed him. Seed doesn't start until you get above the tithe. Boy, I sure didn't intend to go here this morning. But here's the point I'm making is, God intends to bankrupt the devil in these end times. And the money's going to be, it's going to be transferred through a supernaturally instigated process called God multiplies the seed of the cheerful giver. And those that are giving, see, God's not, he's not inventing new money on earth. I know they can dig up some gold and some diamonds, but he's not, he's not just saying, hey, you need a million dollars here, it's in your account. It comes from somewhere. Do you follow me? Otherwise, God would be a counterfeiter. 
when God brings money into the hand of the righteous, it comes from somewhere. Now, in the past, predominantly has come from the hand of other righteous. The majority of seed that's sown into me comes from Christians. And it's righteous to righteous transfer. But they're activating a spiritual principle of multiplication. That now God has to bring in enough money because there's been so much, there has been so much seed sown by the body of Christ now that there's not enough money in the hands of the Christians to pay it all back in hundredfold proportion. So God's got to extract it from somebody else. And I believe it's going to come into the hands of the righteous because it's stripped away from the hands of the wicked by spiritual force, by spiritual power. Do you follow me? And you're the ones causing it to happen. Uh, I don't know if I ought to say this or not. It's not in my notes. Didn't even think about saying it. But we're talking about what will you allow? How long will you allow the wicked to have the money? Because you have no seed in the ground. Your seed is working to strip away the wealth of the wicked. Now, I also believe this. I believe there have been generations past that have sown and sown and never saw the harvest. Either they didn't believe or it was the wrong time. Whatever. It would be they didn't believe. But God's not mocked. Whatever is sown is going to be reaped. And God looks at the body of Christ how many know he looks at the body of Christ today as the same body of Christ that existed 2,000 years ago? We're the same body. We've just grown up. We've grown up. But we're the same body that existed right after the, right after the crucifixion. Three days later when Jesus breathed on us and received the Holy Spirit. Well, really the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Almost 2,000 years ago. We're the same church. How many know you're the same person you were 10 years ago? 20, 30, 40, 50 or more. You're the same person. All that happened was certain cells died up and were replaced by others. Amen. Some cells were added. Amen. Some, a whole lot of extra cells were added. But you're the same person. And we're the same body. There were just people that died and others came in and multiplied. But we're the same body. So the seed that's been, that's been sown in the past by the body of Christ will still be harvested by the body of Christ. What I'm getting at is I believe we will harvest not just the seed we've sown, but the seed every past generation has sown that was never harvested upon. And God's going to use 2,000 years of, how can I say this? Gathered together, multiplied seed to in a short time bankrupt the, the kingdom of darkness. Any volunteers to be used in that one? See, it's amazing how we say, oh God, I'm just not called to prayer. But God, I am called to receive the wealth of the wicked. <laughs> Amen. Everybody wants that one. But I believe, I believe to a high level it's going to be dictated by cheerful giving. Amen. I better move off of that one. Got, you, got kind of, you got kind of quiet on that one. So God gave us dominion. In fact, if you read Genesis chapter 1 there again, Look at verse 20 and 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed. The final thing we see that God gave man to dominate the world was, was the power of seed. What will we allow? And how much can we believe God, right? Are you still with me? See, I believe nothing can happen 
around me unless I allow it. At least it's my desire to believe at that level. I believe we have a right to believe at that level that nothing can happen unless you allow it. The enemy, the devil can't even move without a person to move through. I don't believe the devil can do a single thing on earth unless a person cooperates with him to do it. See, even to operate in his own form of the supernatural, he needs to find a witch or a warlock, some type of shaman, to cooperate with him. I had heard this preached years ago, and we don't have proof in Scripture for it, but I believe it. I, I tend to believe it. Do you remember in, in Mark chapter 5 where they went across uh, the sea and the great storm rose up and they started crying out for fear and they woke up Jesus and said, peace be still. Go over there, go over there. We're not going to read through it, but I want you to see what I'm getting at. Mark chapter 5. It's important that we see cause and effect in Scripture. God's a logical God. This word has to fit together. All right, in, in Mark chapter 5, verse 35, it says, In the same day when the even was come, he saith to them, unto them, Let us pass over to the other, other side. Then the storm rose up, and he said to it, Peace be still, right? And there was a great calm. They went from a mega storm to a mega calm. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the gatherings, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now we know this was the man inhabited by legion over 2,000 devils, right? Caused the pigs to run to the ocean and be drowned. Some point to the power of the devil in Mark chapter 4 and say, look at this. The devil was able to cause a typhoon to rise up, a great storm to rise up. And nearly sink the ship. What hope do we have against a devil like that? Can cause a storm anytime he wants to. I personally don't think the devil can cause a storm anytime he wants to. Otherwise your house would be under a tornado every day. You'd have to live in a storm shelter if he could do that. I believe, and what I've heard taught in the past, is that when he, Jesus got to the other side, the man from the unclean the man with the unclean spirits met him was the man that was being used by the devil to proclaim the storm. This was a demoniac that the devil had totally possessed and had control of his mouth. Because the man was given dominion over the earth, not the devil. Satan has never had a bit of authority on earth, personally. He's got to find a person to use. So I believe when he saw Jesus coming, his direction, that devil, those devils are going, we've got to stop him. So probably 2,000 of them at one time said, blah, blah, blah. you couldn't make it out because 2,000 spoke at one time. <laughs> the man proclaims, I command a storm to arise and sink that ship right now. But a greater... Then the 2,000 devils rose up and said, Peace be still. And then came to the other side and dealt with the one who voiced the storm to begin with. So he didn't just stop the problem. He dealt with the root of the problem. Can, can you follow that? Now, I know when you hear things, you have to, you have to let it, you know, marinate's a good word. You know, you got you to process it and see, does this make sense? <clears throat> It's a theory. Okay, it's a theory. But I am convinced the devil can't do anything without a person to speak it. Why else would he need witches? Why would he need warlocks? Why wouldn't the devil just go around and call storms wherever he wanted to? I've heard, I've heard of, of the witches in the Marshall Islands would cause stones to flo float in the air. Well, the devil can't just throw a stone whenever he wants to. He's got to have somebody do it. 
given that authority. And there's a lot of witchcraft in this area. Why do you think maybe God will want you here is to shut down some of the authority they're using and bring in a cloud of glory instead? Gross darkness requires a gross people to function. Do you follow me? Gross darkness requires cooperative people to give it access to the earth. That God's got a glory generation, a glorious bride rising up to shut down this operation. What will we allow? Are we satisfied just being caught up in ordinary daily life, going through the motions, living like everybody else? Or are we going to rise up and be the, God, the people God's called us to be? Those that use their opportunities to proclaim the word of God. I want to more now than ever use every spare moment I have. I understand there's family time required. There's getting, but, but when you have the time to be decreeing the word of God over your situations and over your area. It doesn't take, it doesn't take five hours to pray. You can pray in 30 seconds. Just get in the habit of having your confession cards of stuff you want to take place and read a verse. Or read, a, read something you're believing for and decree it. And get in the process of, of disallowing darkness to move in our midst. Luke chapter 10. We'll call this China chapter 10. This is China's verse. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Jesus said, Behold, I give you power. That's, that's exousy authority. To tread upon serpents and scorpions. And over all, say all. We shouldn't be afraid of darkness. We have power over all of it. All the dunamis power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm us. Nothing shall hurt us. Nothing shall hurt us. Can you believe for that? What will you allow? Nothing to hurt us. But the word tread upon, in some verses, is, is also translated trample. It means the same thing, to trample. That means not just to kind of walk over gently. That means to do your stomp dance. I used to talk about sometimes people get a presence like they have, you know, have 25 devils tap dancing on their head. The devil's treading upon our souls when that happens. We get all oppressed and anxious and fearful and whiny, crying and hopeless. But God says it should be inverted. We should be the one tap dancing on the devil's hand, head, trampling to stomp down. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in a... Uh, Replacement swimming pool now. I've had to cut out my deck, redig things. Everything's shifted out. I'm putting in new, new uh, uh, block placement for the foundation. So to do it, I've got to dig out. I've got to put bricks under that, fill it with sand, and then take a solid four-inch concrete block, put that on it, and then I'll take it and I'll slam it down. I've only broke one. To tamp it down. And I may do this several times, boom, boom, but when I, I am compressing that foundation spot. I'll be, I believe we can do the same thing. Just take your feet like concrete block and compress the devil. Stomp him, trample him. And it says we trample with our exousia authority. How do you use your authority? With your mouth, with your words. There's power in your words. You trample by speaking and speaking and speaking. Have you ever been so mad at something or somebody you felt like you could put your fist through a wall? Some of you probably have actually done it. Amen? You're so mad and 
And if you had a chance to hit hit that, you wouldn't hit them just once. You'd hit them all. If you could get, how many of you got a hold? Of, if you get a hold of the devil, you'd hit him and hit him until he couldn't. I mean, devil, it wouldn't be like you silly devil. You'd hit him. You'd kick him. You'd stomp. You'd bite whatever, and keep stomping. We've got to realize. That we don't battle with our fists with natural weapons. We battle with supernatural weapons. With our words. And the way we pummel the devil. Is by continuously speaking what God has already said about your situation. It, the Bible says we've been given this, the word of God. Which is the sword of the spirit. A two-edged sword. Piercing, right? Right? Our words are like a sword stabbing the devil. And you can get to the place you start imagining every time you speak the word, you're stabbing a devil. Just running him through in Jesus' name. Amen. By his stripes, I am healed. And start confessing the word. All my house shall be saved. And you run him through and, and you, you get vigilant about it. Adamant about it angry about it that the enemy would try to bring any level of curse into your vicinity what will we allow do you see this what will we tolerate and god gave you words this is the part that that's a stronghold here's a stronghold here's a major maybe the number one religious stronghold that exists try to tell a traditional, religious-minded Christian that your words carry power. Well, I know the Bible says that, but, you know, we just have to do what we can. Not realizing that in the kingdom of heaven, words are like a sword to the power of darkness. That words are the number one tool God gave us. They are supernatural in force. Words move mountains according to Jesus. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And try to get that through, so, through to somebody with a religious stronghold that has been raised up. You just try to be a nice person and survive till the rapture or till you die, right? And it's like bouncing off a, a concrete block. But I'm telling you, we've got to get that revelation. Past the stronghold, our words change the course of our future. And change the future, the course of the future of the world as well. Amen. Paul told Timothy, you've got a war over the prophecies that went before you. What's he mean? Keep speaking them. Keep casting down anything opposing that. Stay on course. I believe it's time for us to trample some things. Amen? Well, have you got anything out of this this morning?